Today's episode is brought to you by BCB Group. You're going to be hearing more about them later on in this interview, which begins right now. To take your pick, you can either have the recession and good luck with your stock market if that happens, or we don't get the recession, in which case inflation ain't coming down and there ain't nothing transitory about high interest rates and yields are going to go higher. Either way, equities are toast. FOMO is dead. Tina is dead. Goldilocks is dead. They're all dead. I'm joined, of course, by George Noble, uh, a veteran in the investment industry who has you know, a background that is I- incredible. George, you've worked with some of the best investors in the world, uh, managed some of the most successful funds in the world. Tell people a little bit about your background, and, and then, then we'll get into it. Th- thanks for having me. So I was very fortunate to uh, have started my career in 1981 when I went to work for this little company in Boston called Fidelity Investments, which had $8 billion under management, only $3 billion of which was in equities. Hard to believe, this is the company which today has almost $5 trillion under management. And so I started uh, in 1981, I was a retail analyst, uh, covered a bunch of consumer industries, also including automobiles. I was fortunate enough uh, to have Peter Lynch, I became his uh, research assistant, his third research assistant, uh, a couple of years into my career at Fidelity. And I was very lucky. I was actually the auto analyst when Peter made his journey to Detroit and visited Chrysler and Ford and General Motors. I carried his bags back then. I knew enough to keep quiet and just listen. And I was in the room and we had all day with Lee Iacocca and the Chrysler people. So I was incredibly fortunate to have had that experience. So I should just say, I had Fidelity when I was, became Peter's assistant. I then went on to become the foreign stock jock. Uh, the Fidelity Overseas Fund was, fa- was, was, was started in the last day of 1984. I was the, I was the uh, manager from inception. It was actually a blessing. It was a curse, really, more than a blessing. But I had the number one fund in the country in 1985. In the six years I managed the fund, from December of 85 till January of uh, 91, yeah, I got that right, uh, the fund was the number two fund of all mutual funds in the country. I um, rode the Japanese market. Uh, on the way up, it was a large part of the performance record of the Fidelity Overseas Fund in the late 80s. And then when it peaked out at the end of 89, I was like, hmm, maybe we can make some money shorting this sucker. And so I was willing to stay at Fidelity, but unfortunately, uh, Fidelity could ill afford at that point to have hedge funds because the view was if they were seen to be shorting stocks that would not sit well with their shareholders. And so uh, I remember Christmas week of 1990 sitting in Ned Johnson's office who, by the way, God rest his soul, he just passed a few weeks ago, saying to me, George, this is a great idea. It's just only one problem. You can't do it here. And so I left, went on to start uh, my first hedge fund, um, ultimately grew, I think we had $28 million at inception, grew to a billion four. Uh, the, the returns were highly satisfactory. I really can't talk about those returns. They were highly satisfactory. Due to a health issue in the family, that fund had to get closed in 96. I did a bunch of other things. In ninety five, in 2005, I came back again, uh, started another fund, also got up to about a billion four when a billion four was a lot of money. Um, and I met my day in 2009. I blew it in 2009. I had a great 07, a great 08, but I, in 2009, I got too aggressive. I actually turned bullish in 2009, believe it or not, but I turned uh, bullish too early and the market didn't bottom until March. Uh, I turned bullish in January, and I got off to a really rough start, and I was burned out, so I closed the fund. I tell you all that only because I really tire of people. It's really the Wall Street way. Everyone talks about their wins, and they're invincible, and they never make mistakes. You know, I'm the guy who had the number one fund in the country, but I'm also the guy who had who had to hang his head down in shame and close his hedge fund in 2009. We're all human. We all make mistakes. And... You know, I guess you asked the question, what have I learned? I've learned so many lessons. I guess one that comes to mind in the way you ask the question, you know, sometimes the market makes you look smarter than you really are. Sometimes the market makes you look dumber than you really are. Trading God's giveth and trading God's taketh away. And this business is hard. May not have seemed that way the last few years with central banks around the world pursuing the most reckless monetary policies ever. So everything's going, you know, from the lower left to the upper right. Um, but this business is hard. And I'm going to go back to the most fundamental lesson I've learned from my mentor, Peter Lynch. Know what you own. Know what you own. 
stock market's not a game. It's not a momentum play. It's not a thematic thing. It's not, oh, I'm buying this because it's going up and Kathy Woods is a genius. Know what you own. And what I really observe, I observe many things. One of the things that troubles me is how much people don't know what they own. And it's not because they're stupid. It's because they either get caught up in the, in the, in the spirit of the moment, the momentum, or they're told they can't beat the market, so they just buy an index fund. And these index funds mindlessly buy equities, pushing the prices up with no price discovery. But as Peter Lynch would say, and I urge everyone to go on YouTube, um, there's a great clipping of him, a, a recording from 1994, where he's giving a speech to the uh, press club in Washington, D.C. And he points out, and he's it's written in his book as well, there's a stock behind every company. It's not a lot. A share is not a lottery ticket. You own a piece of a company, but that's such like a quaint, antiquated notion. It's been irrelevant the last few years. But I think part of what the market is going through right now is 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 is, is, is we're deflating this liquidity-driven edifice, and value will once again will matter. And the problem is, for me anyway, and I'm talking too much, um, is that pe- people are just caught up in what's been working the last few years, and they're now going to get an education. They can get an education one of two ways. Yeah, they can read about it in a book. My father said there's two ways of learning, by precept, read about it in a book, or by experience. And learning by precept is a far more economical way. But I'm telling you, too many investors out there right now, they're going to get an education. And I fear it's going to be a very expensive education. What lesson are they going to learn, George? And it, what, what assets do you think they've been crowding into that are the most susceptible to drawdowns in today's environment? Well, uh, Jack, you had um, the brilliant Michael Howell on a couple of weeks ago. I've known Michael for over 30 years. He's one of the best in the business. And as he explained in your um, podcast, it's all about liquidity. And the central banks around the world are now in the process of withdrawing liquidity and that's going to have a disparate impact on uh, various asset prices. So I think the uh, we, we've had the everything bubble the last few years. Everything's been driven up. Stocks, bonds, real estate, commodities, collectibles, baseball cards. It's the everything bubble. And now they realize that because inflation's a problem, they need to do something about it. And the way to do something about it is slow down the economy. The Fed's told you they want to slow down the economy. They've, they've told you they want to tighten financial conditions. Translated, they want the stock market to go down. Everyone always says, don't fight the Fed. You know, at the bottom, when, 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 they, when things look dire and the fundamentals look terrible, and the Fed starts pumping money into the system, people say, don't fight the Fed. Okay, well, don't fight the Fed. They're telling you that they want the stock market to go down. We've had, um, as I said, irresponsible, reckless monetary policy. They kitchen sinked everything. You know, I understand why we had the pandemic. We had you know excessive monetary policy. You know, we, we had peak fiscal impulse, peak monetary impulse, peak valuations, peak bond prices, peak everything. And so that caused the economy to accelerate. It caused companies to over earn. Look at a historical chart of profit margins. And it caused valuations to surge to levels which are completely out of whack with history. And now it's all normalizing. And so the assets that are going to get hit the hardest are the ones most sensitive to liquidity. So whether you're talking about, you know, the Kathy Wood arc type stocks, stocks on 20, 30 times revenues, loss making companies, crypto, SPACs, Merrill, all the speculative garbage. You know NFTs now, now they're doing now they're doing mortgages in in, in in crypto land like really, I mean all that stuff, nada no bueno as they would say. So I think you know and that stuff's been getting killed. I suspect that's the stuff that will continue to get killed. And but now they're starting to get to the real stuff. So you look in the stock market motors recently, you've seen the general so to speak, the Fang stocks you know be it you know Amazon you know Facebook etc cetera, etc cetera, they're starting to get hit. So. I think when the tide's going out and people say, what should I buy? What if the answer is you shouldn't buy anything? What if the answer is you should be in cash? Or what I really believe, because look, no one knows where the market's going to go. It's just my opinion. You're seeing a huge rotation from 
you know, long duration to short duration assets from virtual to real, from crappy growth to quality value. I want to be careful how I say this to commodities. So what I really believe is that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. So I, I've been, for instance, very bullish the last year. And you can go look at my Twitter feed. I suggested a year ago already, I'm on, I'm on the record with this, it was last summer saying people should short Kathy Wood, short ARC, and go long XOP as a proxy for energy. I'm not trying to be a jerk about it and take a victory lap. It's, it's all there. It's up 300%. I don't think that trade is over. So I would run, not walk as fast as you can away from any liquidity-driven asset. And that's going to tend to mean, for the purposes of people watching this podcast, for best in the stock market, high PE stocks, growth stocks, Kathy Wood type stocks. When you say high valuations, you know there were quite rich valuations. I think a company like Snowflake went IPO'd at something like 100 times price price to sales. How does that compare? You know, you've been in the market in a long time. You've seen a lot of cycles. Are there comparable times when during the dot-com bubble, there were stocks that were even you know, more richly valued than 100 price to sales? Or is it, is it something completely different? Jack, that's a great question. You know, I've been through many booms and busts. I was there in 87. I left Fidelity to start a fund to short the Japanese market. So the Japanese market peaked at 39,000 at the last day in 1989. Never seen that price since. I was there in 2000 for the tech wreck, NASDAQ 5000. I was there in 2008. And I will say what we've seen now eclipses every other bubble that I've lived through. Look, Scott McNeely, who is um, CEO of Sun Microsystems, uh, at the height of the dot com mania around 2000, 2001. Famously said, he went on this rant about what does it mean to buy a stock on 10 times sales and how crazy that is and explaining that if the company basically dividended you back every dollar of revenue, so forget about cost of goods sold and everything else, you'd only get the stock price back after 10 years. And remember, stocks should represent a added stream of cash flows in the future. That's 10 times sales. We're talking now about stocks. You mentioned Snowflake on 100 times sales. I'll be honest with you, Jack. I don't even know what they do. All right. But last time I looked, it's still on 50 times sales. And, you know, just do the math. Liars figure, but figures don't lie. You can't get from here to there. It doesn't work. Uh, there's a study, and I think I shared some of the materials with you, Jack, which shows, for instance, what happens to when you buy stocks on 20 times revenues in one of the slides I showed you. The data shows, and I have to credit my friends at Kalish Concepts, the average stock in history, if you pay 20 times revenues, forget about whether it underperformed the market. That stock had a 55% probability of being delisted. Delisted. Oh, but bro, the story is good. So ignore the charlatans in the mainstream media. Ignore the fast-talking investment bankers. And so you know, how many times have we seen this the last couple of years? And so to answer your question, no. NASDAQ 5000 in 2000 was never this bad. Yeah, Tokyo had some crazy stuff in 1989. But for my money, this is the biggest everything bubble I've ever seen in my career. And we have seen uh, some correction with the S&P down, let's say, 10% and you know, the NASDAQ closer down to 20%. And long-term bonds, as you say, have sold off tremendously. How close do you think we are to reaching you know, a bottom? A lot of people say, oh, once the S&P 500 sells off 20%, there's going to be another Powell pivot, just like there was in 2018. What do you say? History rhymes. It doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And the investor class would have you believe that once the market's down 20%, you know, as, the Powell, as you say, the Powell put, they'll come to the rescue. No, not this time. As a matter of fact, I think there's a chance that this decline could shock people by just how bad, how much, how far down it goes. But let me explain why. The Fed, the White House, have identified inflation as enemy number one. And if you notice, um, it's become a real political problem because you know forty percent of the uh, population is really you know the bottom forty percent of the socioeconomic strata is really hurting. They're getting killed by inflation. I heard Jim Bianco, who's brilliant by the way, he's a must follow. Jim Bianco last week at the conference I attended, this is a shocking number. He pointed out that the 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 average homeowner 
of the price of the average home, the average homeowner enjoyed a $54,000 appreciation in the price of their home. And the average per capita income was something like 52000 So they made more money in terms of their house price appreciation than they did from their paycheck. That's if you owned a home. So yeah, inflation's up, no problem. I'm richer now, at least on paper, for now. You didn't own a piece of real estate, you got a problem. You're getting eaten alive from rising costs, excuse me. Your standard of living is falling. And that's why, as Jim points out, the Biden popularity rating in the polls has plummeted lockstep with a rising inflation rate. People say the economy is a problem, but it's not an inability to get jobs. Jobs are plentiful. We have a record number of unfilled jobs. I think it's something in the order of 11 million. So normally when people are upset with the economy, it's because people are out of work. This time it's not that at all. It's, it's that inflation is killing them. So the Fed wants to kill inflation. The only way to do that is to have a recession. This idea that somehow we're going to have a soft landing and you know it's going to be like a nice airplane coming in on a glide path, not going to happen. Look throughout history. It never works that way. That, by the way, excuse my rant, is we filed that one away under the heading of stockbroker economics. Stockbroker economics was a title that was given that I first learned of from Andrew Smithers, who's still around. He's a uh, octogenarian. He's a British economist, investment strategist. He served for uh, S.G. Warburg back in the day. And brilliant, one of the most brilliant strategists I've ever met. He had, he had this term called stockbroker economics. And basically what it was referring to are these sort of pithy maxims, these things which sound appealing, but they're a mile wide and, and an inch deep. And so the idea that we're going to have a soft landing, not going to happen. You have one of two choices. They either talk the talk like they are right now. They're talking tough like they're going to raise rates. And they, and, and, and they walk the walk. They push rates up enough to break the economy. They everyone says, well, so they're going to raise rates until they break. You're, it's exactly right. You're not going to get inflation down until, until the economy breaks. That's the point. On the one hand, you can have a recession. In which case, take your earnings estimates and kiss them all goodbye. And then you tell me what the stock market does. On the other side, if they whiff, and people say, oh, they're not going to do it. You know, they've you know, the market's pricey and six rate increases, eight increases, 10. If they don't do it, this is, I mean, people are going to jump on me. I'm going to deliberately use provocative words. Why should I stop now? This is on the road to Weimar, all right? Inflation's eight and a half percent. The same people who are saying it's peaking right now. It's the same crowd who told you it was transitory last year. Why would you believe them? As a matter of fact, if you look at the data, there's good reason to think it's not peaking. Oil prices, 105, floundering around. Yeah, they're down from 130 where they were just for a nanosecond because of the Russian thing. Oil prices have gone up. It's got nothing to do with the Ukraine situation. We can talk about that later. Very important. So oil prices, I think, are going to be considerably higher before the end of the year. It all has to do with a lack of spare capacity uh, in OPEC. The only way that won't happen is if we get a recession. So oil prices up, food prices up, going higher. The Fed cannot grow more wheat. The Fed cannot drill for more oil. This is not going to go away. Uh, you, ha you, ha you, have, you, ha you have inelastic supply. And then when it comes to housing, keep in mind, I believe owner's equivalent rent is something on the order of 30% of the CPI. So that 8.5% inflation number that we just saw, that's assuming a five that that pretends that inflation, house prices, housing costs were up only five percent over the last year. We know that's patently not true. It's more like twenty five percent. So if you just say plug in twenty five instead of five, what does what would the CPI have looked like? Okay, it's a number more like thirteen percent, not eight and a half. So the CPI that you're seeing right now is a lie, and the public knows that. The public feels that. And so the idea that they, and people say, well, is it peaking now? Is it, it may peak. It may peak. That's not the point. But the point is, how quickly will it come down? And so I think inflation is here. Unless Jerome Powell discovers it is inner Paul Volcker, it's not going away. And when you keep, when you start thinking about that, I mean, I've been, I've been taking the over the last few months on oil, interest rates, and the dollar. We have what's known as a triple demerit scenario right now. For those of you that weren't around in the 80s, the Japanese stock market was, was the bedrock, the driving force behind the Japanese stock market was a so-called triple merit scenario. You had falling interest rates, falling dollar, and um, a falling oil price. 
the reason the falling dollar was a positive for the Japanese stock markets because it kept capital flows in Japan. It didn't go out. Now we have the opposite. We have the triple demerit scenario. We have rising interest rates, rising oil prices, and a rising dollar. And that is that is kryptonite for financial for financial markets. So I think we're in a really, really bad place. I don't want to yell fire in the theater. You know, someone said to me, if you're bearish and you're wrong, you're an idiot. If you're bearish and you're right, they hate you. I'm about as negative as I've ever been in my career. It's muscle memory. I've seen this before. I'll plead guilty. I did not participate on the upside, you know, on the way up in some of this stuff. It's, all, it's, 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 it's Looney Tunes. It's craziness. But as Michael Guyad, who's a good mutual friend, always says, there are no such things as cycles. There are only, those things as gurus. There are only cycles. And so I spoke before about overachieving and underachieving. Kathy Woods, Kathy Wood had her day in the sun. You know, people say, George, you shouldn't be so hard on her. No, I am going to be so hard on her. You know why? Because she's blowing up billions of dollars of people's money. There's, it's because we've seen this movie before. There's nothing new under the sun. In 1999, 2000, their names were Garrett Von Wagoner, Kevin Landis, Ryan Jacob, Henry Blodgett, Alberto Villar, who actually wound up going to prison. Okay. It's the same old, same old. Except, to go back to your question and where I started this rant, how's this compared to other ones? She's done it on a scale which leaves the other ones in the dust. I rest. <laughs> All right. Let, let's get into ARC. Uh, what in particular about ARC and the stocks that it, it holds do you think is uh, uh, indicative of? The current moment and the current correction, and I'll just play devil's advocate. And you know, the other day I was looking at a normalized chart of Berkshire Hathaway relative to ARKK since ARKK started in in 2014. And you know, even with the massive 65 percent corrections it's had, ARKK is still slightly overperformed Berkshire Hathaway. So, what do you say to that? <laughs> hey, very good question. So let's go back to 2020. In the depths of the pandemic, when the Fed injected all this liquidity into the system, all of a sudden, David Portnoy is schooling Warren Buffett. Like, did Warren Buffett get stupid all of a sudden? Like, what happened? Did David Portnoy discover the magic secret to investing? You can't. There's nobody who can argue that Warren Buffett's better at the stock market than I am right now. I'm better than he is. It's a fact. You're just going to have to deal with it. And by the way, you guys probably remember, he had some of this really crazy stuff. He would do this thing. He had one thing where he had a bunch of dice or whatever in one of his cups, and he shook it up. And depending on the letters that came out, that would be the stock that he was buying. And it was going up. I mean, I want to shoot myself, all right? Okay. So Kathy Wood, I'll give her credit. She's a masterful marketeer. Um, the story, may, as my friend Joel Tillinghast of Fidelity would say, runs the OTC fund or the low price fund, I should say, one of the greatest managers Fidelity's ever had. The story may be right, but the price is wrong. And this goes to narrative and people not doing the work and people not knowing what they own. And for that matter, Kathy Wood not knowing what she owns. I'm a former auto analyst. I've looked at her Tesla models. They're not worth the paper that they're written on. And frankly, I don't care if this podcast is seen by millions and she sees this. I hope she does see this. I'm happy to debate her. She literally throws stuff against the wall and sees what sticks. Her stocks, to come back to the performance record, people look at her record and they say, oh, look at the returns. But here's the problem. Those are time-weighted returns, not dollar-weighted returns. And what do I mean by that? So when you're looking at Kathy Wood's returns, don't just look at the time-weighted return of 29%. Sorry, sorry, of 40 some odd percent, whatever the number was. You have to look at dollar-weighted returns. And by that, I mean Weight the returns for when the money actually came into the fund. Back in the day at Fidelity, Peter Lynch, the greatest of all time, his fund compounded at 29% a year. That was a time-weighted return. But if you looked at what the end investor actually got, it was more like, I don't know, 12% or 15%, some much lower number. You'd say, well, George, how can that be? I got news for you. It's real simple. You think FOMO was just invented? We had FOMO at Fidelity in the 80s, back in the 80s, right? So people are always buying the highs. Peter's a genius. Then the market goes down, they all sell. So the average investor got a number much, much, much lower than 29%. Okay, so you look at Kathy Woods, you look at the returns. The average investor has lost money with Kathy Woods. Why? Because all the money came in at the top. So that's the first point. Second point, if you look at the risk she was taking, the beta of her portfolio, 
Because when you look at returns, you have to ask yourself, how much of it is just she's a beta merchant? She's just buying the highest beta, most speculative garbage she could find. And how much of it's skill and security selection? And so, for instance, if you, I haven't looked at it the last couple of weeks, but if you take ARC and compare it to the Qs, QQQ, just buy NASDAQ. You go back, you know, enough years, she's underperformed the Qs. And she took a lot more risk. The story may be right, but the price was wrong. And now... She's paying the price. What I marvel at is that the, her assets, she's still got, she's had, I think ARC's still taking in $700 million in inflows this year. She's running, I don't know, 40 or $50 billion. This market will not bottom. This market will not bottom until she loses all her assets. This episode is brought to you by BCB Group, Europe's leading provider of crypto-friendly business banking for institutions in the crypto space. They also provide trading services, allowing you to trade FX and cryptocurrency quickly and at scale. They specialize in efficient execution of large orders in illiquid markets. So if you are an institution looking to make high volume trades, you need to check out BCB Group because a great trade idea is worth nothing if you can't execute it. And that is exactly what BCB Group helps you to do. Their mission is to empower the global financial revolution through sustainable and innovative banking. Really glad to have them as a sponsor. So if you want to take control of your digital assets, please check them out at bcbgroup.com slash jack. That's bcbgroup.com slash jack. Thank you. And let's get back to the show. You, you mentioned beta and that's essentially a correlation. So if a stock has a beta of three, if the S&P 500 goes up 10%, the stock probably will go up 30%. If the S&P 500 goes down 10%, the stock will go down 30%. And in, in this particular instance, you mentioned the beta to the NASDAQ. And the NASDAQ was the most typical, most uh, uh, you know, indicative example of stocks that went up from the COVID crisis because interest rates were so low and they're these very long duration. You're, they're not going to most of the money that they're going to make isn't going to be out until 2027 and that sort of thing. Uh, I want to get your take on that as well as to what degree is investing in Arc sort of a macro call? Because I would say, George, you know, d- despite all of your investment wisdom, I would go with Kathy Wood over you if the 10 year note would stay would stay at the record low of uh, 33 basis points but now interest rates are rising so at what point is it just Kathy Woods in the wrong macro environment and it doesn't really have to do with stock picking right no i think the question is very well put um, you know she might be in the wrong macro environment now but she certainly was in the right, right macro environment before so rather than attributing her success to skill she had the wind at her back like one of the things i like people to look at i've done i've done this numerous times Superimpose ARC, not just against NASDAQ in 2000. I mean, that one we know by now. It's a bubble inflating and then bursting. But take ARC and superimpose it over the Austrian 100-year bond or a 30-year zero-coupon bond. Just take a really long-duration asset. And you'll be – most people might be surprised by what they see. So you're telling me it wasn't skill after all. Hmm. So it's not just the valuation expanding and compressing, as you just mentioned, but it's also the growth rates for a lot of these stocks accelerated because demand was brought forward during the pandemic. So whether you're Zoom or your Teladoc, which just had another stock split last week, or your Amazon, which I'm bearish on. So many Wayfair, so many of these companies had demand brought forward. So what happens? Growth accelerated. And as growth accelerated, valuation expands. And valuation expands even more because rates are going down. So you have peak valuation on peak earnings growth, on peak margins. On peak valuation because interest rates are so low and risk premia are so are so narrow too. Totally. So now we run the movie in reverse, and guess what happens? Not hard. So, you know, when people are getting caught up in the midst of the bubble, you know, Alberto Villar, Henry Blodge, all these guys, they were riding high. I mean, go back and look. They're just go Google. These guys were up like, you know, 50, 60, 70%. And then in the ensuing years, 2001, 2003, they went, they went down like 95%. 95%. And I believe that that's closer to – that's as good an approximation of the truth as any is what's going to happen to Kathy Woods. So oh, 95 percent. Gee, George, you were wrong. Shown's going to go down 85 percent. I mean, look, it was 160. It's now 50. It's already gone down 70 percent. 
What's the, de- yeah. well, you know, what's the definition of a stock that's down 85%? It's one that goes down 70% and it gets cut in half again, all right? So, you know, and, and then the worst part of it is, this is true for the market more generally, let's segue into something else. People haven't sold. She hasn't got any redemptions. And that that gets to a bigger point. I don't want to make this a less beat up on Kathy's session. But the market more generally, you had over a trillion dollars of inflows into equity, equity funds last year, ETS, mutual funds, all the rest. And as Walter Deemer famously says, a retired brilliant technician from Putnam Investments, the public always buys the most at the top and sells the most at the bottom. You've, you had over a trillion flow in last year. I think it's been, I don't know, 150, 200 billion flow in this year. It's only been in the last two, three weeks you've seen any redemptions. I think there was like 20 billion, 13 billion, a billion. The public, the bull markets, they don't go, they don't die so easily. The public still wants to believe in the dream. But if I'm right, and interest rates continue to rise, and or interest and, and earnings estimates start to fall as growth ebbs away, and we don't even have to get into a debate about a recession or not. If we get an economic recession, if we just get an earnings recession, an earnings recession combined with higher interest rates stemming from stagflation, that's like kryptonite for the stock market. And you say, well, George, you know, rates have gone from 170 to 290 on the 10 year. Like, come on. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not anchor on 170. Jack, if you came down from planet Mars and you had no idea where things were before, and someone said to you, well, inflation's 8.5%, may still be going up. And the discount rates, wherever it is, I've lost track. And the 10 years at 290, I think it's almost pushing three today. So I would say to you, wait a second, inflation's at eight, eight and a half, and you're telling me that's with a bogus CPI number? And you're telling me the bond market's at three, it's at 295? And the discount rates at wherever it is? Like, like, are you crazy? And so people say, well, you know, the Fed might make a mistake with monetary policy. <laughs> You mean they might make a mistake with monetary policy? What do you call last year? Rates went from one percent to inflation went from one percent to seven and a half percent. Didn't do anything. Uh, so, uh, so, George, I I'm pretty close to agreeing with you uh, on a, a lot of things. But just to play devil's advocate, I think that the inflation picture relative to forward rates and interest rates it's a lot better than it was, you know, six months ago. Let's say, I, and I can't imagine a scenario in let's say December 2023, when inflation is down to 4% and the 10 years at 5%, hey, then you'll actually have positive rates for the real rates for the first time in, you know, probably since before 2008. So uh, I guess that, that depends that inflation will moderate. Do you, do you think that inflation will continue to accelerate? And if so, why? Well, but it doesn't have to accelerate. I mean, I, let's put it this way. The Fed somehow thinks inflation, inflation will be at 4% by the end of the year. I don't see how that's humanly possible. I just yeah. don't. End of twenty twenty two. Yeah, no way. But I was saying twenty twenty three. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, inflation is four percent, five percent. What is the ten year doing at two eighty? Ten years should be uh, four. The very perception that I have is that I think the economy is going to be able to better withstand rising interest rates than people perceive. Yes, it is true. The interest sensitive parts of the economy, like housing, are going to take it on the chin. And yes, it's true. If the thing, the tragic situation in Ukraine gets worse, or China blows up, yeah, we'll have a recession. Fine, okay. But it's the old Ned Davis line: you want to be right, you don't want to make money. I don't want in the IQ contest over. Well, you know, after a careful review of the play, inflation Inc. and you know, hey Jack, oh, no, we're at six percent now in December. Back to you. Well, you know, yeah, Jay George. Was- Jay, oh, let me finish. Jay was right in, in April. That's not the point. The point is, how do we make money? And the point is, interest rates, in my opinion, long-term bond yields are only going to go down for one reason and one reason only, and that's we get a recession. So take your pick. You can either have the recession, and good luck with your stock market if that happens, or we don't get the recession, in which case inflation ain't coming down, and there ain't nothing transitory about high interest rates, and yields are going to go higher. Either way, equities are toast. FOMO is dead. Tina is dead. Goldilocks is dead. They're all dead. Uh, so one uh, thing I note, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're somewhat constructive on the economy. I think if you were more bearish on the economy, you wouldn't be as bearish on risk assets because that means the Federal Reserve can tighten and tighten and tighten. Markets can tank 
markets can puke and the economy will still be okay. The unemployment rate will still be you know, decent. If it was the case that the unemployment rate was hiking back up, then the Federal Reserve would have to do a, a Powell pivot. But it takes a long time for rate hikes to tank the economy. But for them to tank markets, it's happened in a matter of months and it can continue as we've seen. Jack, spot on. Brilliant point, brilliant question. As you know, monetary policy always operates with a long and variable lag. So what you're seeing right now is by dint of decisions that were made over a year ago. So the idea that we can micromanage the economy and Jack say, hey, Jerome, a little more on the interest rate, a little more, it doesn't work that way, all right? So in terms of the economy, but I also want to remind some people of something else. The economy is not the stock market. Those are two different things. And people make that mistake all the time. The economy is not the stock market. And I don't want people to come away from this saying, oh, George is bullish in the economy. No, 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 no. It's not what I'm saying. Because I think the economy is slowing. I think the picture is going to be a lot less uh, buoyant a few months from now than it is today. But will it be enough to give us a recession? Don't know. And so one needs to keep in mind that in past cycles, you had the, the, the debt excesses on the balance sheets of individuals and corporations. This time around the track, the excess in credit extension, the debt excess, is on the balance sheet of the government. It's the governments that have borrowed all the money. For instance, if you look at the uh, debt servicing ratio of individuals, it's extremely low. In other words, income relative to interest payments. Corporations, relatively speaking, in decent shape. And the point is, when you know you think about the economy, its identity, the private sector, sorry, the, the, the public sector surplus the deficit is equal to the private sector surplus. So all the money that the Fed spent, that the, 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 the government spent to, to, to boost economic growth, they spent money they didn't have, boosted growth, that in turn generated profits, which flowed into the private sector and pushed up asset prices. All right? So you had rising profits along with the government buying bonds. They were engaging in QE. Now... We have, and this is a very important point that Jim Bianco harped on the other day as well. If you look at the, at the outlook for interest rates and bonds, it's not just growth. It also has to do with, with, with you got to look at supply and demand on interest rates. Look, this is what determines real interest rates, okay? How much excess savings is in the system? We had the great moderation for many years. Excess savings, the Eurasian sa savings glut. Europeans and Asians with too much excess savings. So what happens? We're, we borrow the money and we can grow much more than we would have otherwise. Now, though, we have a different situation. The foreigners are not buying our bonds anymore. Like, why would you, given where inflation is and given where interest rates are? Foreigners are not buying our bonds anymore. Banks, interestingly, are not buying our bonds. They've cut way back on bond purchases. And the federal government is going from QE to QT. So you look at the, the, the way the supply-demand situation flips around on, on, on bonds, it's a nightmare. And the reason that's important is because, you know, all of a sudden, they go back to Tina. Tina's dead. Well, if you can get, you know, 5 6% from investment grade or whatever, high yield, all of a sudden, it starts looking interesting. So this is, this, is, this is crucially important. So I remain steadfastly negative on bonds it, it, for a couple of reasons. A, I don't think the economy is bad as, as some of the economic bears would have you believe. I believe, I also want to point out something else. In 2018, when the Fed started to, they started the QT, and they started to raise rates. As you recall, the stock market uh, 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 took a dirt nap in the fourth quarter of 18, bottoming only just before Christmas. And people are like, oh, the sky's falling, the sky's falling, we're going to have a recession. Well, guess what? Growth accelerated from 2.2% in the fourth quarter of 18 to 3.1% in the first quarter of 19. So just because everyone's in pain, like, oh, my stocks are going down, my stocks are going down, the world must be coming to an end, we must be having a recession. No, it doesn't work that way. We still have a highly, highly stimulative policy. I want to point out to you, the federal government's, the, the Fed's balance sheet, albeit it was a small increase, it still increased in the month of April. They haven't done anything yet. They haven't done anything yet. And look how much the market's down. So for $50 in double jeopardy, just imagine what's going to happen when they start QT in earnest and rates really start going up. It's crazy how early into the tightening cycle we are and how much pain we've seen. I mean, I know stocks, financial assets are anticipatory assets. They tend to sort of be ahead of the curve, but we're only at 25 basis points. We're recording on Tuesday, May 3rd. You know, uh, by, by all 
likelihoods of by uh, tomorrow, j Powell will announce a 50 basis point hike for, to 75 to 100 in that range. Um, but OK, so explain what you meant about bonds and discount rates. So normally, if someone's super bearish on stocks, bonds are a hedge. But you don't think that in that in this environment? So the 60-40 model is dead, long with the 60-40 model. That's the idea that you know when stocks go down, bonds go up. So it kind of balances your portfolio. Well, that's true in the last 20 some odd years. But if you go back to like 1998, I mean, right now, stocks and bonds are positively correlated, right? From 98 to 2021, they were negatively correlated. But before that, if you go back in the Wayback Machine, they were positively correlated, all right? So the 60-40 model is dead. As a matter of fact, the reason the stocks are going down is because interest rates are going up. And interest rates are going up because we still have a very stimulative, wildly inappropriate monetary policy. So there is no buffer here. Again, in decades past, you know, stocks down, yields fall, that kind of serves as a little bit of a buffer or valuation support. That dynamic does not work now. George, I uh, used to have the belief, or at least I like to think I used to have the belief that, you know, a stock that goes down 70% can only go down 30% more. Why is, why is that not the case? <laughs> okay. It's funny you say that. So I would actually argue sometimes the stock that goes down 70%, say it's at 100, it goes to 30, it might actually be a better short at 30 than it was at 100. Price is not the be all and end all. I mean, if you have a company, let's say, where at 100, the market cap is umpteen billions and the economy is growing, and then things start to slow and then they fall apart. And, let, and let's say the stock's on, you know, 20 times earnings. And then they have an earnings miss. The stock goes down, margins go down. And now it's you know at 30 instead of 100, and the PE's maybe 10 instead of 20. Well, it depends on the outlook going forward. I mean, if growth is slowed that much, if it's gone X growth, doesn't mean just because the PE is low and the stock is lower, it's a better buy. I mean, I'll give you an example. Amazon. Amazon took a dirt net last week. Amazon's 2,500 or thereabouts today as we speak. The peak was what, 3,500, 4,000, something like that. I would actually argue Amazon's a better short now at 2,500 than it was at 4,000. And the reason I say that is if you look at their earnings release last week, it was an unmitigated disaster. Disaster. Supply chain issues, logistic costs. And we spoke earlier about the pull forward with this work from home phenomenon. They stole a lot of growth in the future so that the most recent quarter, they were comping or anniversary the, the, the big gains. Sales were only up 7%. They guided for only, it was, just, it was like the lowest in a million years or ever for Amazon. I forget the numbers. And they guided for only 5% going forward. So the, if you look at, people like to look at PE to growth to say, okay, I'll pay, you know, a higher multiple on higher growth. I'll pay a lower multiple on lower growth. I mean, Facebook now is on, I don't know, 13 times earnings, 14 times earnings. You say, Facebook, really? Yeah, that's because they've gone X growth. And you want to know something? It may be that, the stock's even a short right. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. I'll give you a note. Netflix. Netflix, okay? Netflix is a screaming short right here, right now. I don't care if the stock's down from 700. It's irrelevant. Company's X growth. They're X growth in a commodity business with increasing competition and no defensible moat. And it is unprofitable on a uh, true accounting basis. If you oh, don't, Jack. Yeah. Jack, must you pay attention to those details? <laughs> Come on, bro. Everyone knows non-gap. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, so, so there's an example of the stock. It's gone from 700 to 195, wherever it is today. All right. At 700, you can still believe in the dream. At, nine, at 195, the dream is over. It's a nightmare. Yeah. And so Netflix is a company that it really doesn't make money. I mean, there have been quarters when, yeah, they have uh, adjusted EBITDA uh, positive numbers that look good, but you know, essentially, it's it's not it's an unprofitable company. Let's let's be real. It's even worse. It's even worse. Why? So you're talking before they don't make money on a gap basis because you start dealing with all the uh, uh, employee, shareholder employee expense, all the stock option nonsense, okay? Those are real expenses. Those are real expenses. People work at Netflix or other companies for a lower salary than they would otherwise because they're placing a lot of value on the stock options, okay? 
Netflix is now cut through its 2018 price. So that means anyone who joined the company and got stock options, those options aren't worth me. Those, those, you're not in the money in any of those options. And so what happens? In an economy where stock prices are always up and to the right, people will work for less money because they got stock options. Well, okay, because they put a lot of value in the stock options. If all of a sudden the market's not going anywhere, people are like, eh, you know, I can go across the street and make a fifty or $100,000 more working over there. They'll pay me cash. They will. So this fraud, this fraud, it's like three-card money. Pay no attention to the gap earnings. Look at the non-gap earnings. That's a complete fraud. Complete fraud. And so I think Netflix, and again, none of this is investment advice. None of it. I could change my mind tomorrow. But I'm telling you, I believe Amazon is going to be a lot lower a year from today. So, so I'll just tell you, in my opinion, Netflix is going to be a lot lower a year from today. It's 195. I think it'll be at 95. Amazon's at 2400. It's going to be a lot lower. And then there's the electric car company that shall not be named. That guy? That guy? That company has no moat. There's nothing proprietary about what they do. For the first time in its history, they're being met now with significant competition. They're losing market share to their competitors. That's true, they're gaining market share in the overall market because EVs are growing. But they're losing market share in electric vehicles. Their models are tired and old. I think the CEO is a self-aggrandizing, I'm not going to name it, that stock. I think it's going to go down a minimum, a minimum of 50% over the next 12 months. I, I would. It's like 900 today. I'll take the under on 500. I want to paint a, a spectrum of different stocks as I see them on their earnings, their valuations. I want to you know, see if you agree with the spectrum. And then I also want to draw a conclusion that I want to propose to you, which is you know, from uh, very richly valued to relatively cheap, I think at the sky high where it's, you, know, you can't even see it in, in my frame in the, in the camera, are companies that don't have any revenue that in their S1s that they released where you know, they're essentially allowed to commit you know, legal fraud, they, they, even they admit that they won't have revenue to, till 2027. And then they, of course, forecast you know, a 1,000% growth. Uh, people can perhaps you know, imagine what, what I'm talking about. That's at the top where uh, you know, they are extremely, <laughs> extremely sensitive to interest rates falling. They may make sense if the, you, know, you have negative nominal bond yields, but at 10-year you know, at, at 3%, they are not going to do well. And you know, if it went from 200 to 20, it could still go to 2. Uh, so that's at, that, at the very top. And then there are companies that are just extremely uh, richly valued. That you know, I you know, I would put Tesla in there. No, no, no. Oh, you mean things like Costco, which is a great company, a real company, but it's on forty-five times earnings, things like that. Uh, yeah, I would even say t uh, Costco is even even cheaper. We're we're getting there. So th things like 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 Tesla, uh, where it, it's you, you know, there's a huge amount of growth priced in uh, uh, to, to things like that. Uh, then then we'll say the Costco's. Then we'll say the, the, the Amazons, and Amazons, where they're richly valued, a lot of growth priced in. Then I'd say Apple, and and then at the bottom, Facebook. I mean, Facebook. You said fourteen times earnings, George. I mean, people use Instagram; it's growing, and there are there are you know copper companies that are trading at higher than fourteen times earnings. Why would you want to rather own a copper company than than Facebook? There's a couple things I want to say there. First of all, I am a growth investor. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You want to know what growth is in the current environment? What? Energy stocks. You want to know who has a growing top line and growing earnings that are accelerating? Who's a price maker, not a price taker? I'm a growth stock investor. Let that sink in. Okay? Amazon, Facebook, they're X growth. It's over. It's done. It's done. I want to come to Apple. You mentioned Apple. Apple's a poster child. Without getting crazy, look, Apple's a real company. People have done great with it. I didn't own it. Apple is selling right now on about, I think it's like 25, depending on where the stock is today, 25, 26 times earnings. For something which is growing at 8% a year? Really? Apple even now? I think Apple now is 6% of the S&P and energy is 4. Apple still valued at more of the entire energy sector? Apple, when they came out their earnings last week, said that they're now facing considerable headwinds from supply chain, which could be as much as four to $8 billion in the coming quarter. They basically gave you the profit warning. So it's 6% of the S&P, energy's only four. 
It's on 26 times earnings. Growth is slowing. It's an 8% grower at this point. Would it really surprise you if their earnings get hit? Because just imagine hypothetically if there was a, a lockdown in China and people didn't go out and buy iPhones and maybe they had a bad quarter of the result. Like not that could ever happen. Just imagine. Why would you buy that? Like one of the lines I've been using, I haven't used it yet in this discussion, is that equities represent, in my opinion, return-free risk. I say that again, return-free risk. Very little upside and a lot of downside. Like if you're lucky in Apple, it's 155, wherever it is today, you know, the high was 170, wherever it was, maybe it goes up a few percent. But if you look at Apple on a price to sales basis, it's on about, I think, six or seven times sales, I have the numbers in front of me, which is considerably way above prior peaks. And people say, hey, bro, you don't get it. It's a healthcare company. It's a software company. Take a look at the profit margins. The profit margins have gone nowhere for the last 10 years. It's all narrative. So you have a company with stable profit margins, with top line growth is slow to 8%, and it's selling on 26 times earnings. Oh, but George, you don't get it. It's a healthcare stock, bro. So Jack, what am I missing? Help me. Well, I think when I go on the subway, uh, sometimes I see people reading a book. You know, one out of maybe every 50 people is reading a book. The, t- the other person out of 50 is doing nothing, twiddling their thumbs. But 48 out of 50 people are on their phones. And 47 out of those 48 people are using iPhones. So I, I think it was you know, Warren Buffett who, you know, I, you know like your mentor, uh, Peter Lynch, is a, a value investor who really thinks about these things, said, People talk a lot about real estate. Real estate's you know the the most the biggest a, uh, asset class in the world, I guess, besides bonds, I guess. But I, I care about digital real estate, and people pay a lot of time on their phones, and they you know they're 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 extremely good at extracting money through the app store and, and stuff like that. So look, I you know, George, I I've, I'm very young. I've only been in this you know uh, interview financial interviewing business for three years. But but George, 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 but I'm saying I, I've heard a lot of people say, I mean, how many more iPhones can they buy? And it's never worked so far. Yeah, so, so Jack, all I'm going to say is, I mean, you're talking narrative, okay? And I'm saying whatever you're talking, they're only growing at 8%. And it's selling on maximum valuation. Like, why would I pay? So, like, everything you just said is true. They both can be true. So, they're doing all this good stuff, and they're buying back a ton of stock. Fine. So, let's tell, let's tell Jack what he gets. You're paying 26 times earnings for an 8% grower. Where I come from, that's not a buy. What is a buy for you, George? Peter Lynch would not be buying Apple right now. I promise you that. Just do simple P growth. Put in whatever number you want. It fails the test. Well, what would I be buying right now? What do I own? I own yeah. energy. And energy doesn't have to do with recession and depression. People say, well, you know, if the economy slows down, there's going to be the oil demand is going to go down, yada, yada, yada. The t- facts are, the truth is that in the last 50 years, energy, oil demand has only gone down three times. It went down in the 70s, the early oil crisis in the early 70s. It went down in the great financial crisis. It went down during COVID. The fact of the matter is, not the opinion, the fact is oil demand tends to go up a little bit every year, GDP minus something, all right? And there's been virtually no growth in oil demand or very low growth in oil demand in the, in the OECD. However, the rapidly growing emerging market countries, China, India, you know the story, their per capita consumption of energy is a fraction of what ours is. And that's set to continue for years and years and years. And so oil demand is not going down. It's going to keep going up. The problem is not the demand side. The problem is the supply side. This is where people miss it. And I urge everyone to pay attention to Mike Rothman of Cornerstone. He's the best oil analyst out there. Hey, Mike. Um, And what's happened is it's the supply side you need to focus on. Capital spending in the energy industry has gone down by 70% over the last eight years. We stop exploring for the stuff and drilling for the stuff. It says, as a result, our reserves are declining. We haven't, we're not, okay, we're not replenishing the amount of reserves that we, I mean, the oil is down there somewhere, but we have to drill it out so that uh, the excess capacity right now is commonly perceived to be maybe less than 3 million barrels a day right now. And total world demand is about 100 million barrels. So the point of all that is we're getting caught up in the numbers. We've been underinvesting in energy, and that's going to catch up and bite us in the rear end. And you're already seeing it. You've seen since the second quarter of 2000, 2020, 
Oil inventories have gone down by over 700 million barrels. I think it's 750 million by now. And there's an inverse correlation between inventories and price. And even in the first quarter, which would normally be a, a period of, of inventory building, okay, we, we saw draws. So we are headed, we are headed for an energy crisis. What I just referred to is further exacerbated by the whole ESG debate, where companies, you know, they're, they're being pressured, everyone's got to be green and all this sort of stuff. Everyone's worried about the carbon footprint. So you, you have companies where, you know, if you're the CFO of an energy company, you had a near-death experience the last few years, the last thing in the world you're going to do is put another hole in the ground and drill for more oil. And then on top of it, you're going to have the ESG crowd on top of you if you do it. So we're not drilling for more oil. It's not that the oil doesn't exist. It's, it exists, but we got to drill it out, and we're not. So I think as, as, inventory, as, as, as the story as we go toward the second half of the year is going to be one of, uh, are we running out of production capacity? Now, that could all change if we get a recession. We get a recession, demand goes down. But again, we're not here to debate the economy. We're here to talk about the stock market. And my point is, you know, if Jerome Powell discovers the inner Paul Volcker, does what he should be doing, we'll get a recession, in which case, game over for stocks. And if he doesn't, interest rates going to keep, bond rates, in my opinion, are going to keep going up. And that's bad for stocks. Stocks, either way, are a lose-lose proposition, in my view. But more, even more important than that, it's what kinds of stocks. If we go back to the 70s, the inflation beneficiaries, the commodity stocks, they did quite well. But the whole rest of the market, not so much. So even more confident, even my higher conviction, even more than, you know, is the market going to go down, which I think it will. One more point I want to make on that is I think this rotation – away from long-duration Kathy Wood's loss-making Tesla type of garbage to, to energy and commodity stocks more generally is the right way to be. I will say in the very short run, though, I'm a little bit concerned because energy stocks have done so well that they're prone for, to, to have a correction. So I'm not saying that people should go running out tomorrow and buy energy stocks. But you know, I, I put out on Twitter last year, long XOP, short ARKK, that trade has returned 300%. I said short Peloton at 120 now 20. I said short Coinbase at, I don't know, 300. It's now 120. I said short Robinhood at 35. It's now 10. So to your point about stocks going down 70%, go down a little bit more, right? Coinbase, I want to remind you something. They came public at a directed offering at 250. It traded to 400 or 450 the first couple of days. It's now 120, right? It's still wildly overvalued. That's going to be a $50 stock. It's nominal earnings, George. It's nominal earnings. If you just look up Coinbase price to earnings ratio is like something like seven. I'm just saying. Yeah, I understand. But, but here's the problem. Stocks are forward looking. So Coinbase, those earnings are totally correct. But here's the problem. Those earnings, those trailing earnings came about in a time of extremely buoyant uh, market conditions for crypto. And it was interesting. When I started to get into uh, Twitter spaces and Clubhouse last year for the first time, I'm the most unlikely uh, Fintwit uh, personality. I understand that. But I, I found my, I, had, I made the mistake of going to some Bitcoin maxi rooms. And boy, did I, it's like I walked into a hornet's nest. As crypto becomes institutionalized, and I, I have to take a pot shot at Bitcoin before this interview is over, and I think we're getting towards the end. Um, you're going to see Coinbase's margins collapse. If you look at Coinbase's profit margins, they're outrageous. And you look at the history of other markets, you know, trading stocks, like back in the day, it was like a dollar a share, all this type of nonsense, okay? Now every man and his dog is getting into the crypto space. So those margins are going to collapse. Even if volumes, for whatever volumes do, the margin is going to add even more because of more competition. So that 7 PE is backward looking. I think uh, Coinbase right now is probably on about 40 times earnings, the way I do my numbers. So again, Peter Lynch, call your office. Know what you own. Know what you own. Last thing I want to say on crypto, the big elephant in the room that um, has not been addressed and the authorities are just dragging their heels whether they don't want to be seen to be precipitating a crash or there's been regulatory capture, this whole Tether scam, Tether is the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of the world. It's bigger than Madoff. There's been tens of billions of dollars worth of stable coins that's been counterfeited. And in my opinion, the reason that's important, you know, the, 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 the Tether market cap went from like $2 billion to $75 billion. If you go on the Wayback Machine to the fall of 2020, when Bitcoin was at 11,000, 
with 18 million coins outstanding that, that equated to a market capitalization of about $200 billion. The amount of Tether outstanding at the time was about $2 billion. Tether has been massive counterfeiting, tens of billions of dollars. You can read all about it. It's a complete scam. You say, okay, well, George, what are you worried about? Tether's only, even now, it's only $75 billion, and there's 19 million Bitcoin outstanding roundabout at a price of 40000 roundabout. So Tether's $70 billion. The Bitcoin cap, market cap is $750 billion. Like, What are you worried about? Well, here's what they miss. If you look at the free float of um, uh, Bitcoin, the, non, the, non, the non-hodled supply, it runs around 20%. So let's go in the Wayback Machine. Let's go back to the fall of 2020 when Bitcoin was, was about 11000 and the market cap is about $200 billion. The freely available float, this goes to market structure, which Mark, Mike, the brilliant Michael Green talks about a lot. The free float of Bitcoin was only about $40 billion. Jack, imagine this. You and I start a counterfeiting gig. We make up $70 billion, $70 billion worth of, 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 of fake state, of, crypto, of counterfeit stable coins. And I say, Jack, here's $70 billion. Go buy some Bitcoin in it. You say, well, George, there's only $40 billion that I can buy. It's only market cap. So, Jack, for $50 in double jeopardy, how high are you going to be able to push the Bitcoin price up? So, I believe that crypto is a real thing. I believe in technology. That's not the point. People are conflating. It's technology, bro, or number go up, or zoom out, all that nonsense with what is it worth, all right? And my opinion is, you know, Bitcoin, you get to find a use for it. Technology might be interesting. But all the arguments people give for Bitcoin the true way that Bitcoin is a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, or a million doesn't change. The story is always the same. It's a narrative. It's n- it doesn't generate cash flow. It's not a store of value. As we've seen, it's a risk asset. It correlates with Nasdaq. All right, and I'm totally willing to turn bullish on Bitcoin once once the Fed's guy against the police call your office. Once the Fed's clean up Dodge, and they, they put the crackdown on these bullshit stable coins. But until that gets resolved. It's a no-fly zone for me, and I want to see what the Bitcoin price settles before we have – because to me, the Bitcoin debate, I mean, the price is completely manipulated. It's not a real price. It's game over. We, we, we've engaged in this most reckless monetary policy in the history of mankind, and it's over. They could have kept getting away with this except for one thing, inflation. It's over. All right, last thing, charity. I discovered Clubhouse last year, then Twitter Spaces. I went into a number of spaces. I didn't totally like what I was hearing. I just started, decided to start my own. And we, I think I had 2,000 Twitter followers at the time. It was four months ago. I now have 22,000 Twitter followers. And if I reflect on it, I think it's because people are looking for answers. People are looking for truth. I know I get loud and I can be hyperbolic. I know. But people seem to have the idea that I'm honest, I'm hardworking. Yeah, I make plenty of mistakes. If you're not making mistakes, you're either a liar or you're not taking enough risk. And I bring a 40 decades of experience and a perspective looking at the market through the lens of a, of a you know, guy who ran billions of dollars, trying to teach people how to think about markets. I don't tell people what to buy or sell. I don't give picks. The old line, you give people, you give someone a fish, you give them a meal, you, te- you give them show them, teach them how to fish, you give them a livelihood. And I think that's why people are drawn to my rooms. We're routinely getting ten and 15,000 people on episode to listen. We have, I told you this before, Jack, you chuckled. We have, I believe we are the Saudi Arabia of content. We have, um, because I've been four decades in the business, I know a lot of people. You had the brilliant Michael Howe on your podcast a couple weeks ago. He's a friend of mine, a friend of the rooms. We have people like Michael Howe. Michael Belkin, with whom I got into a room within five minutes, Dennis Gartman, Stan Weinstein, Tom Thornton, Tony Greer. I mean, just go down the list. And so it's like murderer's row of content. So we have the best speakers, the best content, I believe the best moderation, because you probably can imagine I don't suffer fools gladly. I employ the Socratic method, so it cuts out all the nonsense. And we have the smartest audience, because the smart guys come to my room because they know that's where they can hear brilliant speakers moderated properly there's nothing worse than going in a room and it's not moderated properly and then it just goes off the rails yeah and then i'm going to finish what i've chosen to do we've done this for no personal gain instead we've tried to we want to we ask people if they've gotten value from our rooms our spaces to please pay forward and give to our charity of choice which turns out to be world central kitchen 
we've raised in the course of three, four weeks, we've raised $120,000. Our target's 200,000 and we're really building up a lot of momentum. I suspect we're going to be there. So we're doing something unprecedented. We are harnessing the power of Twitter to raise money for charity. And I'm extremely excited about this. And I believe everyone needs to give back and pay forward. And that's what I'm trying to do. So George, uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure and uh, we'd love to have you back. Thanks very much, Jack. Look forward to it. 